everyone. My name is Madhura Naik, and I'm a product manager at ACD. Thank you for joining our webinar session today, and we are very excited to talk about our newest product, the RNA protein co-detection ancillary kit, which enables compatibility of your choice of IHC antibody with key RNA scope and base scope assays. Joining me today is Anushka, our application scientist, who will elucidate on the key applications enabled with dual detection and how the multiomics approach is needed to further our understanding of unique biological questions. So with that, I would like to go over the agenda for today, where in the first part, Anushka will walk us through some research areas and publications highlighting the need for RNA protein detection. Specifically, we will look at examples of examining cell type specific gene expression and identifying cellular sources of secreted proteins. We'll then look at an example of identifying biomarkers and drug target, and then look at characterizing immune cells and determining activation state. We'll also look at how visualizing niche specific expression of RNA targets can be achieved with both RNA and protein detection. And given that we are in this COVID-19 pandemic, um, detecting pathogens with post cell markers is a key application enabled with this new assay. Lastly, we'll look at how uh, RNA and protein can be combined to validate antibody specificity. In the second half, I will introduce you all to a new product offering and show some data associated to this and how this can enable all the applications that we will discuss uh, in the next few slides. Now, I will hand this over to Anushka. Thank you, Madhura. Uh, as Madhya explained, our assay has been well established as a leading tool to uh, assess gene expression with a spatial resolution. For those of you who are not familiar with our assay, the RNA scope technology is an in situ hybridization platform that allows for a specific and sensitive detection of your targets of interest in spatial resolution. The RNA scope technology encompasses three major assays. The RNA scope assay, which is for targets that are over 300 nucleotides in length. And these are most of your mRNA and long non coding RNA targets. This assay is available both in chromogenic and fluorescent formats. Next, we have our base scope assay, which is a more specialized assay that was designed to detect splice variants and highly homologous sequences. This assay can also be used for visualizing point mutations. But for the most part, uh, the targets detected by this assay are between 50 to 300 nucleotides in length. And we make this avail assay available in chromogenic format. And lastly, our newest launched microRNA scope assay was specifically designed to detect really small RNA targets between 17 to 50 nucleotides in length. And these include your siRNAs, microRNAs, and antisense oligos. So with these three assays, we have managed to detect a wide range of RNA targets with a varying length. And what this has allowed us to do is characterize really complex tissues, such as embryos, tumors, and brain, which are highly heterogeneous tissues that are comprised of different types of cell populations that are interacting with each other. So to assess such dynamic environments, you need a very sensitive and specific transcriptomic tool that will provide you high degree of specificity for identification of biomarkers or discovering drug targets and thereby enhancing therapeutic efficacy. With our assays, we have established ourselves as a leader in the field of uh, spatial gene expression analysis, uh, since we are able to provide that single molecule and single cell resolution. But to expand our understanding of these heterogeneous tissues and to further understand the tissue dynamics, a multi-omics approach is needed. 
And with that, we enable the detection of RNA targets with your favorite protein targets with this ish IHC workflow. Now, this ish IHC workflow can enable you to study cell type specific gene expression, identify cellular sources of secreted proteins, and visualize the spatial organization of these different cells and study their interaction, just to name a few. So, by leveraging the best in transcriptomic and proteomic fields, uh, you can really achieve high degree of spatial resolution for your targets of interest. And with our highly sensitive ish assay, combining IHC and IF with this technology really helps you to achieve that. Over the last few years, scientists have used this ish IHC workflow to achieve their research solutions in the re in areas of oncology, immuno-oncology, neuroscience, cell and gene therapy, developmental biology, and infectious disease research. In the next few slides, I'm going to go over a few applications of this really important workflow in all of these different research areas. Let's start with understanding how this can enable our understanding of cell type specific gene expression. So here is an example where these researchers were studying the expression of transcriptional regulator PRDM12 in neurons. So it is known that this particular transcriptional regulator is important in the development and maintenance of certain neuronal subtypes. So they were studying uh, the pain sensing neuron called nociceptor neurons. And they used the ish ILC workflow to identify the expression of this transcriptional regulator in this neuronal subtype. So here, what you see on the screen is they have used an ish probe for PRDM12 and combined that with antibodies for TRKA, TRKC, and TRKP. TRKA is a marker for the pain itch sensing neuron called nociceptor neurons while TRKC is a marker for proprioceptive neurons and TRKP is a marker for mechanoceptive neurons. So as you can see here, the white staining is nicely co-localizing with the green staining here, showing that the, this particular transcription factor is expressed in these nociceptive neurons and is needed for the maintenance and development of these pain sensing neurons. On the other hand, we do not see that the, that, uh, much of co-localization of this transcription factor with either the TRKC or TRKB neurons, suggesting that this particular transcription factor is not necessary for the development and maintenance of these two subtypes of neurons. So it really helps us pinpoint gene, uh, target uh, cell-specific expression of your target of interest when you use this joint workflow. Another really great example is uh, from this paper that was published in Nature last year, where they're studying multiple sclerosis. So using single nuclear uh, RNA sequencing, they were able to map these different oligodendrocyte populations in the human brain. Using our base scope assay, they were able to map these oligodendrocyte populations in situ and visualize these individual neuronal populations. What we wanted to do was study the differences between a normal brain and a multiple sclerosis brain and identify whether there are any changes in the cell population in the MS brain that might be contributing to the uh, degenerative effect seen in this particular disease. What we observed was um, brain consists of brain can show presence of a hybrid cell type called the oligodendroglia, which is a cell that shows characteristics of both oligodendrocytes and microglia. And what they observed was the MS brain showed high uh, degree of expression of these oligodendroglia cells or markers compared to a normal brain. The marker that they chose to visualize microglia is CD74. So they designed a probe against CD74 and used a oleg 1-2 antibody to visualize these cells in situ. And as you can see here, these markers co-localized to identify these hybrid cells, and they were present at a higher degree in these MS lesions compared to normal prey. So this could be potentially one of the reasons uh, 
behind uh, accelerated uh, degeneration in some of the patients with MS. Now let's look at an example of how this workflow can be utilized to identify cellular source of secreted molecules like growth factors, cytokines, and chemokines. Now this was again a great paper that was published in Nature last year where these researchers were studying progression in pancreatic cancer. Uh, they were studying the effect of a soluble factor called leukocyte inhibitory factor origin in these pancreatic cancer patients. What they observed was that the circulating level of this lift was significantly higher in patients with pancreatic cancer compared to normal individuals. And they also showed a correlation of the levels of LIF mRNA to poor disease-free survival. So clearly, this LIF is playing some role in pancreatic cancer progression. So they wanted to identify how this LIF was contributing to the progression of this disease. To this end, they used the RNA scope immunofluorescence workflow to visualize LIF and other markers in situ. They designed RNA scope probes for LIF and for PTPRC, which is CD45, and they used antibody for keratin-19. Keratin-19 marks all the, all the tumor cells here in this tissue, and PTPRC is a leukocyte marker, as you can see here in the stroma. Similarly, LIF, if you observe closely, was also seen to be localizing in the stroma. What is important to mention here is that although PTPRC and LIF are both present in the stromal region, they do not co-localize, which means LIF is not expressed by any of these immune cells in the stroma. Uh, similarly, they also studied another soluble factor, CCL11, and similar to LIF, they observed that even CCL11 was present in the stroma, but not co-localizing with CD45 indicating it is not secreted by any immune cell. They later went on to identify that these two soluble factors were secreted by pancreatic stellate cells in the stroma, which support the growth of these tumor cells in a paracrine fashion by secreting these soluble factors. So by using this joint workflow, they were really able to answer this very significant scientific question in this pancreatic cancer patients as to how these soluble factors were contributing in the growth and progression of these cells, but in a paracrine action. Now let's look at an example of how uh, this workflow has been used to characterize immune cells and study their activation status. This was one of the seminal papers that came out last year, wherein they were studying encephalitis in a melanoma patient who was being treated with anti-PD-1 therapy. Unfortunately, this patient uh, developed some adverse events to this treatment and uh, succumbed to the encephalitis. An important scientific question to these researchers was which immune cells were responsible for triggering this encephalitis in the brain of this patient. So they used this encephalitis tissue and performed PCR sequencing to identify this sequence that was most commonly expressed in this encephalitis tissue. They then designed a base scope probe against this sequence to localize these cells in situ. For this purpose, they combined the base scope dish with CD4 and CD8 IFC to identify or pinpoint which T cell population was responsible for this. And they were able to do so by showing that this base scope probe was co-localizing with CD4 positive T cells and not with CD8 positive T cells, suggesting that the population responsible for this encephalitis was in fact a CD4 positive memory T cell population. So again, they were able to visualize and validate the population of immune cells responsible for uh, inducing this encephalitis. Next, we're going to see an example of how uh, this workflow has been used to identify active immune cells. So we are very familiar with the PDL1, PD1 signaling pathways 
that uh, is responsible for regulating immune cells. Now, in this particular paper, they were able to show the one of the mechanisms by which the PD-1 mRNA is regulated by T cells. They have shown that PD-1 mRNA is carried by stress molecules on microtubules uh, to regulate their translation. And this particular way of regulation has been observed for some of the other inhibitory checkpoint markers like CTLA-4, DAC3, DIM3, and so on but not for stimulatory receptors like OX40, GITR, and so on. So there is some fundamental mechanism of T-cell regulation uh, that they were able to identify and visualize. And understanding this more clearly can greatly improve cancer immune therapy. So in this particular image, what you're seeing is a IHC performed for tubulin and PD-1, and ish performed for the PD-1 mRNA. As you can see in this particular top panel, uh, you can see the pattern of expression of tubulin, and that same pattern is observed for PD-1 mRNA and PD-1 protein. Again, suggesting that microtubules are potentially carrying the PD-1 mRNA for translation. When they treat the cells with a microtubule inhibitor, the whole microtubule assembly is uh, dysregulated, and you can see the PD-1 mRNA and protein dispersed all across the cell. They also went on to show that in a resting state, uh, the T-cell mRNA is, the, the PD-1 mRNA is not co-localized in the stress granules, but under activated state, when the T-cells are active, uh, the PD-1 mRNA is uh, co-localizing with the stress granules suggesting this is a way by which T cells regulate their own activation. So this is an important uh, fundamental question uh, that will help us understand regulation of immune cells and uh, help uh, increase anti-tumor immunity. Next, let's look at an example of how uh, this workflow has been used to identify biomarkers and drug targets. This was a paper that again came out uh, last year, published in Nature Neuroscience, where they were studying Alzheimer's disease model. Alzheimer's is a neurodegenerative disorder that um, is associated with a significant cognitive impairment. Uh, also, some of the researchers have suggested that some of these neurodegenerative disorders um, show presence of senescent cells in certain, brain, uh, certain uh, neuronal populations. But there has not been a direct correlation of senescence to cognitive impairment. And in this particular paper, they were trying to establish this relationship uh, by visualizing senescent cells and amyloid beta plaques in this Alzheimer's disease mouse model. As you can see in this image, by using the RNA-scope-ish IFO workflow, they were able to show co-localization of senescent marker P16 with amyloid beta plaque protein expression suggesting that these P16 positive cells are indeed present in these plaques. They also did this very nice 3D rendering where you can see that this plaque has these P16 positive cells dispersed all over it, showing that, yeah, P16 positive uh, cells are in fact present in the MRI beta plaques of these uh, Alzheimer's disease border traits. So they went a step further and they used two senolytic compounds um, that are FDA approved. Senolytic compounds are compounds um, that, are, that directly target senescent cells. So if these P60 positive cells are in fact senescent, then they would be sensitive to these senolytic compounds. And again, using this joint workflow, they were able to show in comparison to the vehicle treated animal, the animal treated with the senolytic compound, showed a dramatic reduction in P16 positive cells within these amyloid beta plaques. Here is the quantification for the state. Now, this suggests that these cells were in fact sensitive to the senolytic compounds, in turn suggesting that they were in fact sensitive. And so they were able to not only identify these cell types, but also they were able to show in a preclinical model the therapeutic efficacy of these compounds uh, using the joint workflow. 
Next, let's look at an example of how RNA score by itself can be very significant in identifying uh, target gene expression in certain specialized structures of tissues. And using a uh, protein detection and combination, we can enhance our understanding of how certain tissues are regulated. And th this can be very important for uh, studying developing tissues and for uh, studying tissues that are degenerated constantly. And a great example of that is the colon, where you have your colonic epithelium that is shed and regenerated uh, because of a group of stem cell populations that reside in these colonic cribs. So in this particular paper, they wanted to study the role of certain supporting fibroblasts that maintain and regulate the growth and development of these uh, stem cell niche populations in the colon. So they were studying the role of CD90 positive uh, fibroblasts that are present in these basal regions of the crypts, where you find these stem cells that regenerate into epithelium and replenish the shedding colonic epithelium. So by using, again, the RNA scope IF workflow, they were able to show that the CD90 positive fibroblasts are in fact present at the base of the crypt that you can see in red. And GP38 is a marker for intestinal, fib intestinal fibroblasts. And you see nice co-localization of CD90 with GP38, suggesting that this population of fibroblasts is in fact present at the base of these crypts. They were also able to show that these were proliferating cells by showing uh, staining for BRDU. And finally, in this particular panel, they have used a marker for stem cells, which is NGR5. And they were very nicely able to show that some of these scripts showed presence of these stem cells that were surrounded by the CD90 positive uh, fibroblasts that support the growth of these stem cells to replenish the intestinal epithelium. They also went ahead to decipher the mechanism by which this is happening. They studied the expression of a class three semaphorin molecule called SEMA3A. Now these are again soluble factors that are, are released by fibroblasts and are used as a signal for stem cell development. So by using a probe against SEMA3, they were able to show that this fibroblast present at the basal uh, base of the crypts, in fact, were positive for the SEMA3 mRNA, indicating this is the cellular source for these SEMA3 semaphorin. Uh, they also went on to show that these epithelial cells had the receptor for the SEMA3 and RP2. So these were, in fact, epithelium cells um, that were receiving these signals from the fibroblasts and uh, in turn maintaining the development of stem cells. So this helps us understand that by using this powerful workflow, you're able to identify certain cellular signaling mechanisms which are important in understanding uh, tissue homeostasis and development. Now let's look at another very significant application of this joint workflow, especially in the current environment, which is to identify pathogens in host cells and also study the impact of the infection on host cells. Now, this is a great example where these researchers were studying the Rift Valley virus uh, infection. Uh, this is a disease that affects the livestock, but it can be zoonotically transmitted to humans. And what people have observed is some humans that get this particular disease show some encephalitis-like phenotype. Uh, which can be quite severe. So uh, these researchers wanted to study the pathogenesis of this virus and uh, study the effect of this virus on uh, the brain cells. So they used a rat model and used RNA scope to design a probe against the Rift Valley virus RNA and used a IBA1 protein, IBA1 antibody. And as you can see, compared to the uninfected sample, um, infected samples uh, post-infection day one through day seven showed increased expression of this virus, suggesting that the vi uh, tissue that is infected, the virus is multiplying in the tissue, and with increased infection, you see increased infiltration of IBA1 positive uh, microglia in this particular tissue, suggesting that this infection um, 
is increasing uh, initial infiltration, causing increased inflammation. And this is the mechanism through which uh, you can see this encephalitis phenotype in some people. And neurotrace is again a marker for neurons. So again, this technique has helped us not only identify the cells that are being infected with the virus, but study the inflammatory response mounted by the host uh, against this infection. Now, last but not least, uh, we'll study one of the most important applications of this workflow, which is to validate antibody specificity. In certain cases, especially for therapeutic antibodies or diagnostic antibodies, one has to be extremely sure about the specificity of the antibody in identifying the target of interest. And this is a great example, wherein these researchers were studying glioblastoma and wanted to uh, use PDL1 as a prognostic marker for this particular deadly tumor. What they observed was that there was, with ISC, they were seeing a lot of a variability in PDL1 expression across different tumors. Um, but they had also identified that, especially for the ID, IDH wild type uh, glioblastoma tumor subtype, uh, having PDL1 prognostic or uh, having PDL1 expression value can be extremely significant in understanding uh, prognosis for that particular patient. Um, so they were really wanting to identify an antibody that they would be able to use successfully to determine the prognostic, the prognosis for these patients and understand PDL1 expression pattern. But when they tested out a series of antibodies from the market, they were seeing a lot of variability in the expression pattern, as you can see here in the top panel. So they really wanted to validate these antibodies and they used a probe against PDL1 and compared the RNA scope staining pattern to these antibodies. And they were able to identify an antibody that showed a very similar staining pattern to that of the PDL1 uh, mRNA and were able to determine that this is a very specific antibody with a correlation coefficient of 0.94. So by using RNA scope, they were able to visualize expression of this PDL1 target, both RNA and protein, and validate, validate the sensitivity of this antibody. Now, it's important to understand that in this particular case, they performed these two techniques on serial sections and not on the same section. And one of the main reasons is that although this technique works really well uh, for a lot of the antibodies. There are again a set of antibodies um, that show a significant loss of signal when you perform ish and IHC on the same sample. And PDL1 is a good example of that. So we realized that there was a need in the market to kind of optimize this technique further to provide a solution wherein you can perform your ish and IHC on the same sample without compromising your uh, antibody signal. And for that reason, we uh, came up with our new kit, uh, which Madhura will go into detail. So I will pass on the platform to Madhura. Thank you. Thank you, Anushka, for that excellent overview of the need to detect RNA in protein and showing us some great examples of applicable research questions addressed with this. And with that, I would now like to introduce you to a new reagents that enable these applications. The new reagents in the form of the RNA protein co-detection and ciliary kit, when used with the new workflow, will allow researchers to simultaneously examine cell type specific gene expression and identify cellular sources of secreted proteins. Some of you may have already tested certain antibodies and found them incompatible with our RNA scope and base scope assays. Our aim with this new assay is to enable more antibodies to be compatible with our assays, and we will see later some examples of key antibodies that were previously incompatible are now compatible with this new workflow. The new assays essentially contain three parts the new RNA protein co-detection and ciliary kit, which includes the co-detection blocker, co-detection target retrieval solution, and the co-detection antibody diluent, which is also available as a standalone item. This kit has been validated with our chromogenic red and multiplex fluorescent assays 
on both the manual and the Leica platforms and also has been validated with our base scope assays. Along with this kit, we would also like to introduce you to the new protocol where the key primary antibody step is now performed right after the target retrieval step, following which we go on to perform the rest of the RNA-ish steps. We then follow this up with a secondary antibody to detect the protein of interest on the same section, and this workflow has been designed to be completed within two days with the primary antibody incubation lasting overnight as the breakpoint. With this new integrated workflow approach, we have now enabled more antibodies to be compatible with the RNA protein co-detection and reduced the need for extensive screening for compatible antibody clones, resulting in faster time to results. For those of you who may have tested the sequential workflow before, these new reagents and workflows support equivalent or better performance of antibodies and also supports equivalent sensitivity to ish-only detection and more faithfully retains specificity of the antibody in the IHC alone. In this slide, I'm showing what a signal from an IHC-only run looks like in the left panel. And when we add the RNA scope pretreatment, we lose that signal as shown in the middle panel here. And in the final panel on the right, with our integrated workflow and the new pretreatment reagents, we can now rescue the IHC signal, and this, in a sense, makes it easier to combine your antibody of choice with RNA-ish. To enable this compatibility, our team has developed some key reagents, the first of which is the target retrieval solution. The target retrieval with the current RNA scope and base scope assays has been thoroughly validated and is intended for use with the RNA-ish assays alone. However, in some instances, these may have impacted the protein detection. This new co-detection target retrieval reagent has been formulated for improved protein detection while maintaining equivalent ish conditions or ish detection. The second reagent is the co-detection antibody diluent. In our experience, certain commercially available antibody diluents have negatively impacted RNA staining, as can be seen from the image in the middle panel on this slide. This drove us to develop the new diluent which maintains both RNA-ish and IHC staining. Lastly, to ensure no cross-detection between the two chemistries, a blocker is needed, which is only required for the manual chromogenic assays. The main difference between the previous workflow and the new reagents in the workflow is that with the sequential uh, workflow, extensive prior optimization was needed to ensure antibody compatibility, whereas now a pre-validated list is no longer needed, and most IHC compatible antibodies can now be combined with the RNA-ish assay. An example is the CD8 antibody shown here in the left panel with standard IHC. In the middle panel, with ish and IHC without the new reagents and protocol, where we lose the signal. And in the right panel, where we are now able to visualize both signals with the new co-detection reagents and workflow. So with that, I would like to do a quick recap. If you're running a manual assay, you need the ancillary kit. And if you're running this on the Leica platform, you only need the antibody diluent. In this slide, we create a reference for the reagents you would need for each protocol that we have validated our assays for. As an example, if you're running our manual red assay with the new reagents in workflow, you would need all three reagents provided in the ancillary kit. 
if you're running the manual multiplex V2 assay, you would only need the co-detection diluent and the target retrieval. And if you're running it on the LICA platform, you would only need the antibody diluent. We have tech notes available for all of these assays, and please reach out to our excellent support team to help you get started with these new assays. And now I would like to take you through some examples of staining generated with the new reagents and each of our validated assays with IHC antibodies. So in the first example here, we show some data with CD4, CD5, FOXP3. CD markers are cell markers, uh, which are very useful for identification and characterization of leukocytes and different subpopulations of leukocytes. CD marker specific antibodies have been widely used for cell sorting, identification, and cancer diagnosis. FOXP3 is a protein involved in immune system responses and known to be a master regulator of the regulatory pathway in the development and function of regulatory T cell. These represent fairly standard proteins utilized in oncology research. And shown here, combined with RNA-ish, can be used to get more data out of precious samples. The samples shown here are tonsil, head and neck cancer. And as you can see from the panel on the right, both RNA-ish and IHC signal is maintained with the new workflow and reagent with our Lyca red assay. Another example of staining here, uh, the protein detection is performed using our green chromogen, giving a great contrast on tissues where an alternate to the brown DAB is preferred, perhaps due to tissue artifacts. Shown here are examples of CD3, CD8, and KI67 antibodies in the left panel as control IHC alone, in the middle panel combined with RNA-ish without the new reagents, and you can clearly see that some antibody and some ish signal is compromised. And in the right panel, we observe optimal signal detection with both the RNA and protein when used with these new reagents. This run was performed with our manual red chromogenic assays. In this slide, we show compatibility of these antibodies and workflow with our base scope assays on the Lyca platform. Again, in CD3 and CD8 are depicted using the green chromogen and the KI67 antibody with the brown chromogen. The RNA-ish signal is in red in all of these images. And here we show compatibility of these reagents and workflow with the CD68, CD20, and KI67 antibodies on our manual base scope assays. Again, with the RNA-ish signal in red and the antibodies detected in green. Moving on to fluorescent-ish and IF, these new reagents and workflow have also been validated with our manual multiplex fluorescent V2 assays, where we use the TSA detection system to visualize the signals. Shown as an example here are the CD3 and CD8 antibodies on lung cancer tissue with control probe PPIB for RNA-ish. The antibody signal is in white and the RNA scope signal is in red. This is an example of threeplex-ish with KI67 antibody with this new reagents and workflow, a key example of how you can get much more data with more target and detect both RNA and protein on the same slide. And here we are highlighting some antibodies, specifically CD markers, that may have been previously incompatible in combining with RNA-ish and required extensive screening and optimization. Uh, with the new workflow and reagents, the intent is to reduce the amount of screening and optimization needed, and you can now use your favorite antibody clones 
which have already been validated for IHC and use that in conjunction with RNA-ish uh, with this new co-detection workflow and reagents. And lastly, some more examples of CD markers detected with the brown or green chromogen along with the red-ish signal. And with all that data, I would like to conclude and summarize today's presentation. In today's session, we have shown some key examples of how multiomics profiling with single cell resolution can be achieved with the new reagents and workflow. With this new ancillary kit, you can now incorporate RNA-ish into your existing IHC workflow to gain deeper insights and preserve precious samples. This new reagent and workflow have been extensively validated with the red chromogenic and multiplex fluorescent assays on manual and the Leica platforms, some examples of which we just saw. And lastly, we hope that with this new product and key research examples we have shown in this deck, you're now able to utilize the power of two technologies, IHC and RNA-ish, to answer your research questions. And with that, we will now address some questions that have come in through the chat. Thank you very much, both Medora and Anushka. What an excellent presentation. We are all super excited about this protection tool at once. And um, we look forward to um, hearing more about it. And with that, thank you both very much. Um,